Whether you are thinking about becoming a restaurateur or you are already in the business, Michael Politz has written a must read, The Food and Beverage Magazine's Guide to Restaurant Success. Pick up your copy today at Barnes & Noble, Amazon, Books A Million, or wherever fine books are sold. Food and Beverage Magazine Live, bringing food and beverage to life with your hosts, James Beard Award winner Jennifer English and Food and Beverage Magazine publisher Michael Politz. Featuring leaders in the hospitality, branded food and beverage, and CPG industries, many of whom are Jennifer and Michael's friends in the business. For an informal and informative conversation where friends in the business share the latest intel, ideas, and best practices. Live, juicy inside scoop from the tastemakers, newsmakers, bread bakers, drink shakers, spoon lickers, clam diggers, farms, foodies, and friends of the food and beverage magazine world. Here are your hosts, Jennifer English and Michael Politz. Well, hello, everybody, and welcome. I'm Jennifer English. I'm very fortunate to be the editor-at-large of Food and Beverage Magazine, and today we have an extraordinary woman as our guest. Mary Sue Milliken is going to join us, and I can't say enough good things to frame and give perspective to the impact she's had on the culinary world we live in today, and most importantly, to the culinary world we're going to be inhabiting as the culinary industry and the hospitality world come roaring back to life following the pandemic. Of course, she's most well known as the award-winning chef and author. She's a television personality. She's known for her roles on the Two Hot Tamales on Food Network, introducing a world to the flavors that she is passionate about and recreates at her now world famous border grill. And in all her culinary endeavors, she along with her restaurateur partner, Susan Feniger, have created this pathway for us to fall in love with the big robust flavors, the brightness. She has been prescient in her career because everywhere we are today is somewhere she said, look, let's go here together. And she's done an extraordinary job but it's in her leadership with the James Beard Foundation as a trustee and as someone who has been literally helping us understand that we have got to do better when it comes to women in the hospitality industry and leadership positions from the 5 to 7% that we culinary, currently culinarily have to to where we ought to be going and I'm and I'm thrilled for that but it's also in her role that she is helping all of us to grow She's nourishing our consciousness and our intentions to do the best we can for all concerned because we are, in fact, a service industry. We're here to welcome everyone. All are welcome at our table. But today I'm especially proud to welcome Mary Sue Milliken. How are you? Hi, Jennifer. I'm great. Thanks so much for having me. It's always so fun to talk with you because you very consistently and organically and authentically remind us of the best things about our industry all the way from the start and flavors to the future and where we're going to go. I want to ask you just briefly, let, let's talk about how you got here. I don't know that I know the full origin story of how you end up in the kitchen professionally <laughs> because I because I love that you did and we're all grateful that you did, but talk a little bit about the beginning of this and the path that you took to get here? Well, I, you know, I grew up in Michigan and my mom was a great cook. I loved um, eating. I loved flavors. Like, you know, I loved even like raw lemon and, and things when I was a tiny toddler. But, um, you know, I, I took home ec classes because I was of that era when you still could take wood shop and home economics and learn how to cook in eighth grade or ninth grade. Right. And then I, um, I met a chef, a professional chef, who, when I was 16, who was a friend of my older sister's, and he just inspired me. He was so amazingly um, passionate about food, and he was, like, good with his knife and, you know, very entertaining. And I thought, I want to be like him when I grow up. And I, I decided right then that I would graduate from high school in three years instead of four and go straight to chef school on the south side of Chicago in a... a uh, the school that he went to called Washburn Trade School, where they had 
plumbers and pipe fitters and auto mechanics and chefs. And there were about 100 students in the chef department in five different classes. And, you know, there were two women, me wow. and a woman from Nigeria named wow. Olele Khan. And we were um, the only women <laughs> in the school, but we were in the same class. And uh, it was pretty, it was very, um, you know, interesting to say the least. I, I definitely... Um, you know, it was easy really for me. It, what was hard was being, yeah, being a woman and being, um, having to constantly prove myself, but, but the school was, it was easy for me to be like the top of my class. And, you know, I felt like I, I was in the right place. I was loving what I was learning and I was working every night. I worked at the Conrad Hilton hotel for about oh, wow. eight or 10 months. And then I worked, um, at, uh, Maxime's of Paris, which was wow. in Chicago at the time. And when I graduated after two years and, and in chef school at that time in a trade school, you went to school all year round. There was no summer break. There were no breaks for Easter or spring break. It was really kind of getting you ready for a trade that was the service industry that we're in. And I decided I wanted to work at Le, at, uh, Le Perroquet, which was a French restaurant in Chicago that was really cutting edge and doing amazing things. And uh, I, I applied for a job there and um, I didn't get a great response from the owner who, who said, you know, I would, I would cause chaos in his kitchen, he said. And he said, why don't you come work as my hat check girl? And, you know, this was after two years of, of really hard work. And so I, I remember sort of crying all the way home from the interview, but then like having the resolve to just send him letters and call him on the phone every, you know, within about three or four weeks, he said, okay, come on in. You can have a job. <laughs> 325 an hour. <laughs> wow. When you were being trained at Washburn, were you being trained by people who'd gone to the Swiss hotel school, had come up through American hotel programs? Um, and it was still very much a what I'll call traditional um, model of of not just cuisine, but but especially like banquet cuisine, like professional cuisine. People don't today, especially kids today, they may not know how recently our world connected to that and how that connected basically to the Scoffier. Exactly. You part of that, you were part of that essential joint that connects us to that incredible, I'm going to argue, essential past. Because you can't well, do today without that. And, and it's really interesting because we did learn all those traditional, you know, mother sauces and, you know, every traditional kind of French um, cuisine idea. And we even did things like pulled sugar, you know, which is not done anymore. But I, I was really good at pulling sugar in my pastry class. So I learned how to make, you know, all the flowers and ribbons and decorate cakes and, you know, that stuff. I don't I haven't seen that in in probably 50 years, <laughs> but it's a beautiful art when when people do do it. And, and you know, when I was working at nighttime, I was always working for for European chefs, the a German chef at uh, the Conrad Hilton. And we, we even entered food shows at, at the Chicago, you know, food show that happens every year. The big, that just happened. The Restaurant food. Association show. Yeah, they, they would have a food um, competition where you would right. take things like, you know, a veal tongue and cover it in chauffeur and you know little cutouts of black olives and things and and you'd compete to see who could make these kind of a crazy atrocious things that you don't really eat that you just look at but it was it was definitely an interesting time to be training as a chef we i just said we couldn't be here today without that but I think more importantly, how do you see all of that training being essential for the food industry of the future, the food industry, the hospitality industry of tomorrow? How does food 3.0 depend on that kind of connection and history that you provide to us? 
Well, I think uh, that's a really good, great question. I think there's so many kind of um, things that grew out of that whole movement. You know, there were, um, especially in the United States where, where we were just so in love with French cuisine and we had such a love affair. I think the whole world probably did, you know, with, with that um, hierarchy and that discipline and that depth of study of food. And then I think being Americans, you know, uh, we started to really sort of look around and see all these other things like, you know, Chinese cuisine and Mexican cuisine. And we started to really sort of um, find and build on um, those cuisines as well and realize kind of an, and kind of, it was a real aha moment for me. I remember when I kind of had the idea that this French cuisine that I was so in love with, I went and worked in France for a year and a half in Paris at a two-star restaurant. You know, I really was a French trained chef, but then I remember the moment when I, I ate, you know, real Chinese food in the San Gabriel Valley in Los Angeles, or, you know, when I first had carnitas and I remember thinking, you know, this is as good as any French food I've ever eaten, if not maybe even a little bit more exciting. <laughs> and I, I remember really sort of, I think as Americans do, we we're, we're very open and we're very interested in all different kinds of things. And I think we, you know, really embraced a lot of different things. And, you know, of course, Julia Child came up with a, a real accessible and um, kind of put a very um, understandable kind of box around French cuisine so that we could all dive into her books and just understand Beef Wellington or, you know, Coco Van or whatever. But then we also started to see like Barbara Tropp's book on Chinese cuisine coming out. You know, those were like coming out in the late 70s, early 80s. And so we were seeing a change. We were seeing sort of this gourmet revolution, which is what happened in the United States really over that you know course of time, the 60s, 70s, 80s. And then, um, and it's really led to what we, uh, you know, the way we eat today, which is so exciting, you know, and then people like Jonathan Gold in, in Los Angeles started really introducing his readership to a, like, you know, crazy, you know, Cambodian food or, you know, it wasn't anymore just like, I remember we used to use the word Oriental. <laughs> when I was growing up, my mom would say, let's have Oriental food, you know, and that was, that's what they thought of the Orient. It was everything, you, you know, and, and then we started looking at, yeah. Yeah. It, it's kind of it's kind of amazing how and it's a really a matter of the world getting smaller and smaller and us getting you know much more in touch with other cultures. Yeah, um, of course the beloved and utterly brilliant Jonathan Gold. There was an episode of David Chang's show Ugly Delicious where they go out hunting for tacos, and and then he's in another episode with our friend Evan Kleiman, and they're making uh, cochinita pibil. Knishes, and he comes up with this word. And I think he deserves a Pulitzer for this word because he comes up with this word, uh, sacrilicious. And I thought, what a great word. And so um, to me, that's just, that's what puts you on the Mount Rushmore of, of food people, uh, <laughs> things like that. But uh, TV did something extraordinary, and I, I want to reference it because in a minute we'll talk about your own um, extraordinary introduction. You continued that legacy. TV, whether it was watching, you know, Jack and Jackie uh, Kennedy go to Paris, or Julia Child talk about French food, or Chuck Williams open Williams Sonoma to give you all the tools you needed to do the Julia Child mastering the art of French cooking food. There was this moment. But TV also showed us other things through that period of time. It introduced us to so much in the way of food. And then, as you say, we fell in love with the books and people like Joyce Chen and Martin Yen, and we can go on and on. And you continued this pioneering legacy 
of let me show you what I love about my food. And as though the model of the food industry being the doorway to a culture, as much as it is the culture has a doorway to the U.S. economy. We have our first jobs there. They introduce us to the foods and flavors of this new community of people that have come to join us here in our own melting pot. We have all these things going on. And you did an amazing job with, with Susan of creating this introduction to food that most of us hadn't met yet, the same way we hadn't really met French food to fall in love with it, the way we hadn't met the kinds of flavors that we were introduced to. Would you talk a little bit about your awareness at the time and then your, your did you have to be as perseverant to get a show about your food on TV at the time as you did to get the job in a French kitchen as a woman at a time when that didn't happen? How many times have you had to write letter after letter after letter to make something happen? And in this case, TV, or did they come to you? Well, it's really interesting. We opened um, our first little restaurant in 1981. I was 23 and we I'd already, Susan and I both worked in France, she in the South of France, me in, in Paris. We'd work, had lots of other jobs. We felt really ready to be our own bosses. But I think part of that readiness came from being women in a male kind of controlled field. And we wanted to be our own bosses, even though it meant starting out so tiny. We had 900 square feet and one little, we had to, I wouldn't even move to California until we put the stove in because <laughs> she was already cooking on two hot plates. <laughs> out of this little kitchen. She was so determined. We got a four burner stove and that's when I just said, okay, I'll come and we'll do this together. And City Cafe was born. And I think, you know, I California was so different for me from the Midwest, from Chicago. It was just so liberating. The customers would order anything that we cooked, really. It was kind of amazing people were so excited about about our food and whatever we cooked they would buy um and then susan took a trip to india her first vacation in like three years in 1983 and uh when she came back we put a bunch of indian food on the menu and then i took my first vacation to thailand and when i came back i worked in a kitchen actually in bangkok that my uncle um, introduced me to the chef and I worked there for three weeks and came back and put all these Thai dishes on the menu. But, you know, we had such a limited understanding of the Thai kitchen or the Indian kitchen. We had, I mean, I had three weeks in a kitchen, but the dish that I fell in love with most in Thailand was on the street by a, a man with no legs who made in this beautiful big um, mortar and pestle of what we, what I now know is a is a uh, papaya salad, green papaya salad. At the time, I didn't know what a green papaya was. So when I came back, I made Thai melon salad. I made it with three different kinds of melon, um, wow. watermelon, cantaloupe, and honeydew. And I made this very spicy peanut dried shrimp, tons of, uh, you know, chilies sort of dressing. So our That's whole menu good. kind of worked. <laughs> But, you know, and if I were to do that today, I think people would, you know, really not understand or make fun of it or they would think, well, why is she, you know, but back then it just made perfect sense because it was what I could find. And then we decided we got so busy. We got a bunch of write ups in Gourmet Magazine and uh, Ruth Reichel kind of wrote us about us. Julia Child came into the cafe and visited and was a huge champion for us and very, very supportive. And that's when we opened our bigger restaurant, City Restaurant. But the whole menu by that time was global with, you know, Greek dishes and Japanese. And, you know, and we were boundless. And we also wrote City Cuisine during that time, our first cookbook. But when we found the bigger location and we were going to move, we didn't want to get rid of this little cafe that had been sort of so good to us. And we still had the lease. So we decided we'd turn it into either a Japanese noodle shop or a the perfect hamburger joint or a taco stand. And wow. um, we, we landed on tacos because 
we didn't want to drive all the way to East LA to get our favorite carnitas tacos, which was our the treat that we would get like once a month and bring back to everybody in the kitchen or on the in our crew. So we went to Mexico and we drove around in a VW bug all over the country for three weeks and studied the food and came back with our little notebooks full of inspiration and opened our first border grill. Wow. And we had to actually go down to the farmers or to the big giant uh, produce market in downtown LA. And we had Chipotle chilies in our suitcase that we brought back that were, you know, that smoky flavor. And we were asking every vendor, have you ever seen a chili like this? <laughs> you know, this is 10 years before Chipotle opened. <laughs> And so we, we definitely, um, and, but honestly, then we wrote Mesa Mexicana and to get to the answer of your question, it's a long winded answer, but we um, went on the food network at, to, to promote our book on book tour, Mesa Mexicana. And that was all of our Mexican recipes. And they invited us back to be on um, it's, I think it was called chef of the week or something. So each you'd go back and you'd tape in New York, you tape five shows in one day and then you'd, you know, so you'd fly in on Tuesday night, work all day Wednesday, fly out, you know, Wednesday night or Thursday morning. So it would happen very fast, but then they'd put one show on every day of the week um, for five days. And they just loved our, um, our kind of the way we answered or finished each other's sentences and the way that we joked around and they immediately offered us a show. We didn't, We'd never heard of the Food Network because it wasn't in L.A. at the time. It was only in, I think, seven million homes when we first got on to the Food Network. It was so, early. It was. Yeah, there was Everell, uh, Bobby. Um, David Rosenberg and Sarah Moulton. Yes, Sarah Moulton, How to Boil Water, um, uh, David Rosengarten. And uh, Donna Hanover had a sh like a news food news show, and it was and, a lot of fun. Sissy? Sorry, and Sissy Biggers. Yes, Sissy Biggers was she there. had her game show. The yeah. Biggers. I love that. Um, I'm just smiling because those days are such. They seem so far away. Everything that you just shared with us, I'm just fascinated and fantasizing about the idea that we were this close to having our burger culture that we have today, that gourmet burger culture happen 20 years earlier and how much I would, you know, like I just the temptation of you guys doing noodles 20, oh my gosh, those, those are that you want to taunt a foodie, tell us what you almost did and didn't. And I'm like, oh, can you imagine what our food world would be like today? I mean, I'm, my mouth is literally watering thinking about your joy and exuberance and, and como se llama applied to those. Oh, it's just almost too much to think about. <laughs> but let's talk about the future. How do we move forward into food 3.0 as we come roaring back to life from the pandemic with the connoisseurship and discernment to appreciate the things that are worth adding the ampersand to and adding to whatever we become next. How do we know, as you seem to be so expert at, how do we look in the crystal ball and see where we're going and know what to cook? Where are we going? You've done an amazing job of this throughout your career. And at this moment, at the, at the dawn of this Food 3.0, we're turning to you saying, you know, not just what should we do, but what should we eat? Where are we going? Well, that's a, you know, I do think about this a lot. So you're asking the right girl. <laughs> but I, um, you know, ever since I had children 32 years ago, I had my first son and, and uh, the other one 24 years ago. But, you know, that really was the first time I looked at my role in uh, as a leader and, and what, what could I do to make the world a better place through my expertise, which is food? And I really, you know, started getting involved in being an activist around different things. In fact, that's when, that's when we, I, I called KCRW and said, um, I want to have a food show about um, 
this is when Alar on apples yeah. was reported and Meryl Streep went nuts about, you know, she had young kids too. And I think the idea that kids can't eat an apple and be safe was just, you know, so abhorrent. And uh, Ruth Hirschman, the, the then president of the, of the, our local national radio station said, well, that's a terrible idea. <laughs> you don't want to, you really don't want to make people be alarmist about people's food supply. But why don't you come in on Saturday, you and Susan, and you can have your own one hour, t you know, radio show all about food and talk about whatever you want. And you can weave in a few, you know, kind of messages here and there. And that was when Good Food was born. We, we yeah. did that show for the first five years yeah. before Evan took it over. And that it did actually uh, groom us for television, I think, because we were starting. We had no idea what we were doing. But I think the idea that food is so universal, everyone has to have it every day. And so the, the idea that we could have impact, social impact through food, I think has always been really, um, you know, close to my heart. And it's made me think a lot about our, our food systems, about the way we eat, the way we make choices about what we're going to eat. You know, we started, um, early on in the eighties with a heavily vegetarian or vegetable menu. We've had, we have an 80, 20 kind of philosophy that 80% of the food that we cook is going to be plant-based and 20% will be protein based. And we'll figure out a way to make it still look, you know, and, and compete with, you know, the, the steakhouse or whatever that where people, and back then people would get, you know, a, 16 ounce steak and five little snow pea pots on the side. <laughs> and they would think that was dinner if you were like in Boston or somewhere. I remember. And by the way, and by the way, you're, you've always had this 100% delicious. I mean, you could say we were 80% delicious plant-based. We were 20% delicious meat-based. Well, and it was more important to be delicious than anything else. And when you start with delicious, you don't focus as much on the end point as you do the delicious. Is it yeah. a plant or is it a, a face? <laughs> you yeah. know? It, it used to make me so proud because we had this vegetarian platter on the menu and it always had uh, ri basmati rice and dal and a curry in the middle. And then all around the outside were all different kinds of vegetables, sweet and sour red cabbage and, you know, all different kinds of where other restaurants, when you were a vegetarian, you would, you'd get a big pile of steamed vegetables with no flavor, no salt, no butter, nothing. <laughs> and, and so we really took a lot of pride in, in our vegetarian food. So I think can I one, you, can I ask you about that though? When you were talking about vegetarian food, how much of that classic French train were you bringing to the preparation of these delicious plates? A hundred percent. All of our French training has been incorporated into all of our Mexican food, all of our cooking, because that's we, we, we really got that Escoffier sort of baseline understanding of how to braise meat. You know, the first time we went to Mexico and, and cooked with some Mexican old, you know, abuelas, we were kind of, you know, they I think they wanted to impress us. So they would take like a pork loin and then braise it. And we would be like, oh no, that's not a good idea. But if we're going to braise pork, we're going to braise the butt or, you know, shoulder. So, so I think, you know, we would always apply our French technique to everything we were learning in, 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 and everything we were ever cooking. We were always applying that French technique. And it was, I think that, and in flavor was the most important. It, we weren't, we have never been really big on, um, squirt bottles mm -hmm. we we like to tease bobby flay that he's he's the guy he's the mexican cook with the squirt bottles and we're the ones without them <laughs> he's a he's a dear friend and uh, a wonderful wonderful guy and a really good cook too but um i think you know i think the future of the, of the food world is a, a couple of things i could say that i would just recommend right off the bat is is look at ways to uh, satisfy hardcore carnivores with vegetables 
And, and if you can make them make a dish so delicious that they don't miss the meat, then I think that's, that's our task, the task in front of us right now for, you know, climate change, for our, the, the health of the planet, the health of our bodies, all of it. I also think that um, this is something I've really been thinking about a, a ton lately, is that women's voices and their leadership is lacking in the entire food system. And so I would encourage people to buy from women farmers, support women owned businesses, food and beverage entrepreneurs as much as possible and to, you know, nurture and support the upcoming generation of women, because I think that women have a, a unique perspective. And if, 50% of the power in our industry was in the hands and minds of women. I think we would make different choices about how to, to feed ourselves. That question leads naturally into the statistic that at up to half or even more now of students going into culinary programs are women. And we've had this enormous gap and discrepancy between them participating at the entry level and rising to the leadership level. It makes me wonder how many men would get into an industry where they knew they were only likely to get, you know, five out of a hundred of you are going to get to leadership um, and how unattractive that industry might be for them. <laughs> uh, and what does it say about women who got into the industry, knowing that was the prescribed at the moment potential future and still were not thwarted or deterred by that? It's a whole conversation for another show, for sure. And as a pioneer in culinary broadcasting, of course, as people who've been doing this now for over 25 years, can you believe we're still talking about food and there's still so much to talk about? But of course you mentioned something that I think is essential for us to address. And that is the fundamental nature of food as the epicenter of our human experience. Given that, how in Food 3.0 in the future as a restaurateur, as someone who feeds people, how important and maybe unchanging are some of the most essential elements of food and what do you think a few of those things are that we can keep in mind as we build a future in food? Well, I'm, I, I guess, I'm not exactly sure how to answer your question. Sorry. Um, can you ask it again? Let me, let me try this again. Sorry. I was I'm just, sorry. I apologize. I tend to ask you questions at the same time because they see how they connect together and I give you the links of the chain together sometimes. It's my, it's my, it's my, uh, it's my uh, passionate, zealous Achilles heel when it comes to questioning. We're moving into the future of food. Food is the epicenter of human experience. There is something fundamental, as you said, about us eating every day. In the future of food, because of that, because it's so fundamental, because it's so essential, I'm going to imagine that as a restaurateur, there are some very fundamental things, very essential things that we will need to have that will not change in the future of food. Maybe the simplest way to ask this is, what's not going to change about being a restaurateur in the future of food? Well, or what are the things you don't want to change yeah. or make sure we don't lose in the future I, of food? That's I understand. Great. great question. No, and it's certainly not you at all. Um, but I, I think the most important thing that we um, provide society is this social fabric of our communities where people gather and sit around a table and discuss things and come up with ideas or you know, make plans, you know, solve problems. And I think that's what restaurants, they restore you when you go to them, you come away feeling restored. So that's the part that I don't think we're going to ever lose. That's part of our human 
nature. And I think what is so important to our communities are, are all the little restaurants that, that tie us together and keep the lights on at night and, and keep the, the communities vibrant. So I think whether, and I think what's going to, what is going to change or needs to change is portion sizes need to get more realistic. Waste has to, food waste has to be eliminated. Um, packaging needs to change 150%. I was in India right before the pandemic started uh, studying the school food program um, with Share Our Strength, who I was a longtime board member, and we do a lot of school feeding programs. And they serve 40,000 children a day out of a kitchen with pots the size of a, a room, and they do it with zero packaging zero. They don't have any plastic, no paper, no completely unpackaged food. And they do, and it's delicious and nutritious and amazing. So there's a lot for us to learn about, you know, how we get the food to you, but the, what's not going to change is we still need, whether we're second graders in school or whether we're, you know, executives at, a big music company going out for lunch. We need those places where we can sit down at a table and, you know, in and kind of sh shut out the rest of the world and enjoy food and, and people's company. And what did you make of the statistic that 60% of the food that we're going to be eating by the end of the decade is going to be delivered? And by virtue of saying the ghost kitchens and cloud kitchens and virtual kitchens, the inevitability of those are going to essentially put the front of the house on the endangered species list. Not, not to mention the packaging issue, which I, which was one of the biggest heartbreaks for me of the pandemic was taking, you know, back pedaling so far into using more plastic than I've ever wanted to use, believe me. Um, so I guess I, I still don't, I still, people, I mean, first of all, 60% of the food we eat coming packaged and being delivered to the home, that's a, surprising to me, but maybe that's, maybe that's right. Um, I guess I still think there's going to be a huge need for people to gather and, um, you know, spend time breaking bread together, even if maybe they have it delivered to their space or whatever. But I do think that's just going to be an essential part of the human, you know, daily life. So I guess um, it's going to be an interesting transition. That's for sure. It's going to be very interesting. And food is going to have to cost more money. Everybody's going to have to really get used to the idea that food is expensive. Food, it should cost 30%. Sorry? Good food, especially. Yes, but... If we want to preserve, you know, our food systems, we have to pay people more. We have we can't continue to eat artificially cheap food on the backs of immigrants and single parents and and you know the formerly incarcerated who are working three jobs in order to just pay rent. I think we we really those things the pandemic laid bare and 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 there's a lot that has to be looked at there. So. In Europe, a lot of people think they should, they budget for spending 25 or 30 percent of their yearly salary on food. I don't think that's a very common uh, way to look at food in the United States. We're, we're so used to the subsidized kind of food system that we have that we're we really have a, a, a little bit of a warped view of the value. Listen, you're being extraordinarily generous in spending so much time with us. And I am utterly and shamelessly greedy to have these conversations with you, for which I'm enormously, enormously grateful. But it is James Beard Foundation Weekend, and we're celebrating the best in the business again. And this year, the James Beard Foundation Awards are back in Chicago the media and broadcast awards were yesterday. The big awards, as they say, uh, are tonight. And they look very different than they have in years past. I think they're much more reflective of the food world we live in today. 
We live in a food world today with fewer tablecloths and fewer lots of things like tablecloths. And we're literally setting a bigger, wider, more informal table and everyone is welcome at our table. And cuisine as it's being defined as the, as the recognition of the standard bearers in our industry for the excellence that we see everywhere has required us to redefine and reappreciate what could be considered excellent. And we've done, I think, a good job of that under your leadership and your colleagues. Can we talk about the 2022 James Beard Foundation Awards? This is a very exciting day, and I am sure that it must be exciting for you. Can you talk about them? It, it's, it's extremely exciting because we, you know, have been working really hard at the foundation to um, to really look at excellence in through a different lens, a more inclusive lens, uh, you know, and to look at at really a, a wider range. And and I think it's it's super um, exciting to see so many people of color, so many different kinds of 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 nominees. It's it's you know from young to you know well seasoned it's just extremely it's still the the beard awards it's still just as exciting as it ever was to get a nomination or to to get an award and but it's a lot more it looks a lot more like our kitchens and our restaurant workers and and the ownership of restaurants has looked for a long time so that's exciting we we did a whole revamp over the last 4 years of the committees that work on the awards, you know, it's all a very separate thing from, from the leadership of the actual foundation. And I think we've, I'm very proud of the work that that's been done by the foundation. I, I don't serve on those committees for the awards, but I'm, I'm aware of what they've been working hard to do. And, and it's a big job to, you know, find a very diverse set of people all over the country to, to really, dig into each community and and figure out who are the the people who are doing the most exciting work and you know on a holistic level how they're you know uh, you know how their restaurants are serving the community how their restaurants are are you know are being excellent so it's it's really i think it's a really exciting i'm excited for the for all the nominees tonight and i uh I'll be watching on Twitter. <laughs> redefining excellence, redefining delicious is akin to, for instance, redefining beauty in our culture. Can so talk, true. I mean, to me, this is, we've got to break out of the limits we were constrained by. Yeah. And even it's funny because I think I was so immersed in, my career as a young chef and owner of restaurants, I didn't really realize that I was surrounded by, you know, white men who were getting all the awards. I didn't even, it didn't even register very much because I, you know, I was just, I had to just work as hard and as fast as I could. And I think when I finally kind of came up for air and looked around, it was, it became really clear really quickly that that we had to make some changes. And when I was invited on the board of the Beard Foundation, I wasn't a huge fan of of the work they had been doing in the past in the the, the very you know the last few years. And so I said, if I come on, I really want to make changes. And believe me, they were already on the path to making changes. It's it's absolutely by no means me who who made it all happen. But I've I've been so pleasantly surprised and so energized and you know inspired to be a really hardworking board member because I see the the real authentic um, desire for change and to really to really you know frame it and like you said you know what is beautiful you know what what you know and our taste changes all the time but i think we're in the food industry we really needed to make a, a really an overhaul of the way we looked at excellence to me excellence and irresistible 
um, could be twins, right? I, I, I love the idea of something being irresistible. And I love the idea that the 2022 James Beard Foundation Awards have done an amazing job to recognize that irresistible can come in a slice of pizza, in a taco, in the most improbable ways and in the most Im improbable, unlikely places. Go back to city. Can you imagine, how do we tell people today, how do we tell kids today that as far away from what was considered irresistible and delicious in our public consciousness in food, fancy, fine dining, orangerie, right? Like you were in Los Angeles, you, you, you chastens even, you know, uh, and you come back to city. The gap between that, even though the bite was irresistible, it didn't have that same, you understand. How do we explain to kids today how far we've come and how far away from where you started and what was considered beautiful or delicious? Well, I think, you know, it's good, it's good for kids to understand that if you really uh, dig in and follow your heart and, and make things irresistibly delicious, people will find you. Yeah. Um, and if you treat people really well also, I think that's, I think there's a lot of very talented culinarians who maybe aren't as successful as they could be because they are, you know, it's like being an artist really. And like my husband's an architect and, you know, running a business and being an artist is really not easy because you, you, it takes two different skill sets altogether. So running a restaurant and, and making it successful and being able to cook irresistibly delicious food are, are not always, you know, and easy to achieve. And I think I've seen some really talented chefs um, not be able to really bust through the, the business side of how to run a, a restaurant, which is, is difficult. And we're, we're, you know, it's a, it's a game of very small margins and lots and lots of details that have to be looked at. But I think, um, I think there's a, the, you know, the great thing about the industry is that it's so adaptive and we are about hospitality. So we, we are, you know, automatically sort of at the forefront of, of how to treat each other and how to treat our staffs and our, our customers. And I think we're bet we're much further along in that than many other industries will be because we already have those skills. We already know how to do it. I don't want to, I don't want to leave without giving you the opportunity to talk about where everybody can find your delicious food, what you are doing next, because you are an architect of the future of food, as we all are by the choices we make, but you especially are taking us, as you have throughout your career, to the most delicious places that exist. Where are you taking us next, and where can we find this delicious food you're going to make for us? Well, let's see. You can always find me in Vegas at Mandalay Bay at uh, our bar border grill there, and we also have a bunch of uh, stadium food, so if you're watching sports or if you're, you know, the baseball stadium, the football stadium, or the T-Mobile arena. We have great food in all three of those. And then in, in Santa Monica, we have our new restaurant called Socolo, which is sort of a Mexican California version. You know, the Zocalo in Mexico is, is the center of the town where people gather. And it's a really fun neighborhood, uh, delicious restaurant. And then I am spending probably... The majority of my time these days, or half my time at least, I'm spending on Regarding Her, which is a nonprofit that started just in the last two years uh, to, to really promote women in our industry and to uplift them and mentor them and help figure out a way to, to turbocharge their careers so that we, we get to that, that gender parity in the industry that I frankly thought 
43 years ago, we'd be a lot closer to when I was 64, but we're not there yet. We just got a message from our publisher, Michael Pulitz. He just had lunch at Border in Las Vegas. He had your ma, he might. He said it was insanely delicious. And thank you very much for that. Oh, um, thank you. What one or two things as our friend in the business have you discovered that you want to turn us on to? Because now is the time where we're changing seasons and I love that you are always one of the most food curious people I've ever known. What's delicious right now? Oh my gosh. There are so many things. Um, you know, it's summertime. So, you know, all the fresh beans are going to be coming in. The fresh flageolet beans I adore. And I love to make bean salads in the summertime where, you know, I get the fresh beans and, or fresh lima beans are also amazing. And I cook them and then I mix them with lots of fresh herbs and shallots and lemon and olive oil. And um, what else? I just, we, we've been, I've been really into eating a lot of um, chicories, but they're, they're kind of maybe a, few, a little, a couple of months ago or a month ago, but uh, in, including um punterella have you have you had that it's so delicious it's my favorite salad to make it's a it's a big sort of like giant chicory with all these little lobes on it and you have to shave them thin and soak them in ice water and then toss them in a really strong vinaigrette of anchovies and garlic and red wine vinegar wow. and Boy, that is what that's my favorite salad to eat these days. Well, the last time you and I got to break bread together, we were literally breaking bread together in Hermosillo, Mexico. And the bread turned out, even when we're in this amazing restaurant, that bread continues to be one of the most memorable bites of that meal. And of course, that was the bread that Don Guerra from Tucson, Arizona, nominated this year as the James Beard Foundation Best Baker. So our fingers are crossed for him. But I love that our most recent shared food memory was breaking bread together. And I'm just going to thank you for everything you do for our industry, for your inspiration, for the generosity, your leadership by example. But most importantly, for girls and young people of all stripes, you are somebody that we see. If I can see it, I can be it. And you give me the example of what's possible. Not only can a woman do this, but all young culinarians have to look at your example of your generosity and participation and courage to change and lead and speak up. You've made this incredible culinary industry and hospitality industry so much better more delicious and i'm so incredibly grateful that you took all this time to be with us today thank you so much oh jennifer thank you it's been such a always it's a pleasure to to see you to talk with you to brainstorm and and you know think about the deeper ways that our industry affects everyone i i always enjoy myself so thank you I'll, I'll say this in closing, that ours is a service business. We are in service to humanity. We're in service to your delight and your nourishment. And I love that we continue to serve. And if there's anything in addition to the hospitality, we have to remember that we are building a future in which we will continue, God willing, to be in service. So thank you. <laughs> Whether you are thinking about becoming a restaurateur or you are already in the business, Michael Politz has written a must-read, The Food and Beverage Magazine's Guide to Restaurant Success. Pick up your copy today at Barnes & Noble, Amazon, Books A Million, or wherever fine books are sold.